Good morning again. The word comes to us this morning from Mark 8, 9, 10, 15 and 16, as per the sheet in your newsletter. So Mark 8, 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. Mark 9, verse 30. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were, because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. In Mark 10, verse 32, Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will arise. In Mark 15, verse 15. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. Three days later. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll a stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Good. As we come to God's word, let's uh, pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for the gift that the, the Bible is, the, these holy scriptures. We pray that your Holy Spirit will illuminate, will bring light to our dark hearts, uh, chase away the shadows, and may we see Jesus more clearly by your Holy Spirit as we dig into your word through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, if I was to ask you what the significance of Easter is, what, what would you say? What would your reply be? What if we asked your neighbour? What would your neighbour say? Or your colleague at work? Or, or maybe uh, the people you play bridge with? Or if you're a young mum, your young mum's group, play group, if you asked them what Easter was about, what, what would they say? Well, you'd probably get a few replies. Might, one might be, well, it's a holiday. Uh, those that have got young children might talk about an Easter egg hunt. Uh, some people might even say it's something to do with God. Uh, but what if we asked people in the street 
what would they say if we asked them about what the meaning of Easter was? Do you celebrate Easter? Um, yeah, a little bit. Do you celebrate Easter? No. Do I celebrate Easter? No. Do you celebrate Easter? Yes, I do. What's so important about Easter? What's it all about? I believe it's because the day of Jesus was born, or it has to do with God. Why do you celebrate Easter? Uh, it's a fun family time. Is there any significance to why we recognize it as a holiday? I don't recognize it as a holiday due to my religious beliefs. Do you celebrate Easter? Mm, not really. I just know that you pick up Easter eggs on Easter. Why do you celebrate Easter? Because uh, my parents did. What do you think the significance of Easter is? What's it all about? Uh, it's about uh, Christ. Uh, the Christ of... Uh... Why do you celebrate Easter? Because that's how I grew up. What's it all about? I don't know. What's the significance of Easter? Um, I really don't know. Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Yeah. You know, that's the historical meaning of the holiday. Oh, really? That's it. Learn something new every day, don't you? Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Yes. Do you know that's the significance of the holiday? I do now. I know most people celebrate it about Jesus, but I'm not religious, so. They say Jesus rose from the dead, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's uh, something of Jesus, I don't know. Well, I think it has something to do with, like, God, or I don't know. I don't really know that much, but. Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Is that? I really don't know what I believe. Yes, <laughs> it is a shame, isn't it, that uh, so many people don't know about Easter. Uh, but the wonderful thing about Easter is that you can always learn something more. Even if you're like the folk in that street interview, many who d didn't know what Easter was at all. Or whether you're like people sitting here, I'm sure, who are super interested in Easter and read about it and know about it and, and love the Lord Jesus Christ. We can always learn something new. And on top of that, the Easter story never loses its thrill for those whose hearts are kept captivated for Jesus. And so today we're going to ponder and explore Calvary, the cross, and the empty tomb. And we're going to anchor ourselves in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, for those visiting here, we've been covering Mark over an extended time. A few years ago, we did the first eight chapters of Mark, and then we had a break. And then a couple of months before Christmas, we picked up in the second half of Mark. Last week, we looked at the triumphant entry of Jesus on that first Palm Sunday. And today, we consider the climax of Mark's Gospels, Mark's Gospel, all the Gospels, really, which is the Easter story. Now, unlike the other three Gospels, Mark makes us work hard to get to the meaning of Easter, the why of Easter. Mark's excellent about telling us what happened and giving us great detail, step by step, what happened through the Easter, right through to the empty tomb. But the why of Easter? Well, in Mark, we have to sort of roll our sleeves up and do quite a bit of hard work to get to the why. So to unlock the meaning of Easter in Mark's gospel, we're going to look at <coughs> three things. Uh, first of all, we're going to look at the predictions that Jesus made about what would happen in Jerusalem in the couple of weeks, maybe month or two beforehand, he made three predictions of what would happen in Easter. Then we're going to see these predictions fulfilled. And then we're going to use these to unlock the meaning of Easter. So first of all, the three predictions. Well, the first prediction happens in Mark chapter 8 at the midpoint of the gospel. Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say I am? And for a change, unusually, probably for the first time, the disciples get it right. <laughs> they get it right. Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Christ. You see, the disciples knew that Jesus wasn't uh, John the Baptist who rose from the dead. He wasn't Elijah come again or he wasn't some other prophet. That's what the word on the street was. They knew he was the Messiah. Now, Jesus realizes the disciples have no idea what that means. So to prepare him for them for the shock of what will happen in Jerusalem, he gives them three predictions over a period of time. And the first one 
is straight after the confession in Mark chapter 8 from verse 31. Mark 8 from verse 31. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. Now Mark says that Jesus spoke plainly about this because in the rest of the Mark, Jesus spoke in parables. And parables, well, they were hard to understand. And even the disciples had to go up to Jesus afterwards and say, tell us what it means. But this is not with these predictions. This is not a parable. This is not a mystery. Jesus spoke as plainly as he could. And what was he trying to emphasize? Well, there's a a few things to note in this prediction that will be repeated in the next two. First of all, Jesus refers to himself in the third person as the Son of Man. And this is a reference back to the prophet Daniel, where Daniel sees this vision, this glorious vision of the Messiah, the Son of Man, coming to God in the heavens at his throne, in his glory, the Son of Man. And this is Jesus' favorite self-designation for him. Other people didn't call him the Son of Man. Now and again, someone might call him the Son of God, but only he referred to himself as the Son of Man. Now, this is not the main point of the predictions. Uh, It does have implications for later on. The three main things that each of these predictions has is that Jesus uh, will be rejected by the elders, by by the religious leaders. He'll be rejected. He will be killed. And he will rise again from the dead after three days. After three days. And that's what will happen. And so that's the first prediction. And this fails to sink in. And we can hardly blame the disciples because the disciples are fixated on the Messiah in the Old Testament where the passages talk of a reigning king who would come in glory and set up his throne. So when the word Messiah was mentioned, that's all the, the, uh, the disciples could think of. They didn't think of the passages in the Old Testament that would talk about the suffering of the Messiah. And this is why Jesus then says it again a few, well, for us, just a chapter along. A short period later, in chapter 9, verse 30, Jesus repeats this prophecy. See what is the same as we look at uh, Mark chapter 9 from verse 30. 30 He began <clears throat> Jesus did not want anyone to know where he wa- to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples He said to them the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men they will kill him and after 3 days he will rise Second prediction this time short and to the point the son of man will be handed over killed and then rise again And even though this is short and to the point, the disciples, they miss the point, which is why Jesus then gives a third prediction just a few days later. This time there's much more detail. See if you can pick up the extra detail as we read from Mark chapter 10 and from verse 32. Again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to them. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Uh, Now, in the previous predictions, we learn that the Son of Man will be rejected and he will rise again. That middle bit about the killing, the death, is in more detail here. So what's the new things that we learn about Jesus' death. Well, the first thing we learn that's new is that it'll actually be the Gentiles that kill Jesus. Uh, It'll be the the religious, the Jewish religious leaders that hand him over, that betray him, Uh, but it'll be the Gentiles that kill him. The second thing we know is that his death will be cruel. It will will be just awful because we are told uh, that he will be mocked, spat on, and flogged or whipped before he is killed. But Jesus doesn't end on a note of gloom, but on triumph, because no matter how cruel and horrible his death, three days after, he will be raised again. 
And so these are the, the three predictions that Jesus gives his disciples to prepare them for what will happen as he goes to the holy city. Let's see how these are fulfilled. Uh, all through that week, from the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday to the, the darkness of Good Friday, all through that week, the religious leaders reject and attack Jesus' claims that he's the Messiah. And all this accumulates in a farcical trial in the wee small hours early on that first Good Friday morning. There the religious leaders condemn him to death, but they don't have the authority to kill, so they must take him to Pilate, because Pilate, as governor, has the only one that can ex have people executed. Now, Pilate knows that Jesus has been handed over because the religious leaders are lying for a start, but tremendously jealous of Jesus' success. So Pilate tries to wiggle out of it, but he's on pressure from two sides. The religious leaders are saying that if he doesn't crucify Jesus, he's, he's disloyal to Caesar, and the religious leaders uh, and the crowd, they're just crying out, crucify Jesus. So we pick this up in, in Mark 15 from uh, verse 15. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. They began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and they spat on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put on his own clothes, then led him away to crucify him. And so Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the one long promised, was mocked. He was spat on. He was whipped those terrible 39 lashes ripped his back apart and then finally crucified. And Mark records his death very simply but very powerfully with these words. Verse 37 of chapter 15, With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. And I wonder if the disciples understood Three times Jesus had clearly said that he would be killed and three times he had clearly said he would be raised from the dead. Do you think the penny dropped with the disciples? Do you think sort of the gears got into motion and they did the maths? Do you think it dawned on, him, on them that in three days' time something wonderful and glorious would happen? I suspect not. In their shock and their grief, I would imagine all they could deal with is the despair of having their dear Lord killed. Now Mark continues the Easter story. Three days later, women who were devoted to Jesus arrive at the tomb. And to their surprise, the large stone has been rolled away, and the tomb is clearly empty. And then to their fright, to their terror, an angel speaks. And we see this in Mark uh, chapter 16, verse 6. And the angel says, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. But do you know the woman ignored the angel's instructions? The instructions were, don't be alarmed. But instead, the woman are tremendously alarmed. Verse 8. Trembling and bewildered, the woman went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And do you know, this is where Mark ends his gospel. This is it. There's no more in Mark's gospel as it was originally written. He finishes here in Mark 8. I'll read it again. Imagine you're reading all that gospel. Imagine also, Mark was the first gospel written. So Matthew, Luke, and John weren't written, so the original readers can't say, well, it's finished like this, I'll just see what Matthew says. They didn't have that option. So this is how Mark finishes his gospel. Trembling and bewildered, the woman went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Imagine if a modern author did that. <laughs> Ew, yeah, they just books wouldn't sell, would they? And this is where the hard work comes of us trying to work out 
what's the meaning of Easter? What is the me- we've got the empty tomb, but we've also got some women that are tremendously afraid. So what is the meaning of the empty tomb? Now, the other Gospels, they have the woman getting over their initial shock, and then the other three Gospels, they consider the meaning, and they help us to work out what the meaning is. We have to roll our sleeves up and put on detective hats to work out what Mark is trying to tell us about the resurrection, about the empty tomb. And the first thing to consider that if you've got your Bible with you, you will see that there's an extra few paragraphs tacked on. In my Bible, there's a big underline, and then in brackets it says, the earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have the next few verses. Every Bible that I've looked up has that there. Some footnote or comment that after verse 8, that the earliest and most reliable manuscripts do not have this second section, or this last section. Now, most Bible scholars and Bible teachers agree that these extra paragraphs have been added later. They're helpful. They summarise what Matthew and Luke, uh, how they end their gospel. It's very helpful, but they agree that that was not how Mark finished his gospel. So, like the original readers of Mark who didn't have the other gospels to look at, we're going to have to make sense of the why. And Mark has not left us without the key verse that unlocks the why of Easter. It's found just after the third prediction that Jesus made. So Jesus said, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed, will die, but rise from the dead. Now straight after that, they're on the road. James and John come up to Jesus and they take him aside and they ask for the power seats in the kingdom. They say, oh Jesus, will you do us a favour? And Jesus, he's pretty pretty switched on. What's the favour? What are you asking, James and John? Oh, we want to sit on your right and on your left in glory. And so it's a totally inappropriate question or request for the two brothers to ask. So Jesus calls all 12 together. And he says, if you want to be a leader, if you want to be a ruler in the kingdom of God, you have to be a servant first. You've got to serve people. Those you want to lead, you've got to serve. And then he, he finishes it off. And uh, this is Mark chapter 10, verse 45. And he finishes off with these words. And you'll see at the end of this verse that the answer to the empty tomb and the meaning of Easter is found here. Verse 45 of chapter 10. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, here it comes, and give his life a ransom for many. This is the key that unlocks the empty tomb in the gospel of Mark. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That is the why of Easter that we see in Mark's gospel. He gave his life, he died on the cross as a ransom for you and I. Now this is reinforced later by the Apostle Paul writing to his young charge, Timothy. And we see this in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. God our Saviour wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men. Ransom. That's the key to unlock the Easter story in the Gospel of Mark. Now, this ransom business is a bit hard for us to understand. It's not something that really happens in the 21st century New Zealand. Hands up those who have known someone that was ransomed in Cromwell lately. I mean, it's the stuff of movies, isn't it? And it's the stuff that's in fiction books. And we understand in principle that someone is taken against their will and until something valuable, normally um, you know, a truckload of cash is handed over, that person stays a prisoner until they are ransomed. And then we, talk, we, know, we know about ransom notes and all that sort of thing. But in, th- in practice, we just don't see it. But I have a story that I think helps us understand the ransom that happened on that first Easter. True story. So let me take you back to the Second World War. And on the last day of July 1941, the Auschwitz 
sirens announce the escape of a prison. Uh, this infamous concentration camp where mainly Jews but also other folk as well, Christians who um, resisted um, Hitler and his regime, were in a, a, a camp where they were systematically exterminated. Now, for a siren to go in the concentration camp, it meant that one had escaped. And so the commandant calls all the prisoners together in the courtyard and makes them stand in the, in the scorching summer sun. And the prisoners know what's going to happen. The commandant is going to choose 10 at random, and those 10 are going to be marched off to what they called a starvation bunker. It was a concrete bunker, uh, sort of buried under the ground, but you could hear the cries of the prisoners, the other prisoners could hear, where they would be put and they would be starved to death. And so the commandant with his uh, Gestapo assistant is walking down the lines of the prisoners and randomly choosing 10 people. And he comes to one man and, cho and chooses him. His name is Francis Gawaski. And the man cries in despair, my poor wife and children. Now at that moment, an unimpressive figure of a man with sunken eyes and round glasses in wire frames, stepped out of the line and took off his cap. What does this Polish pig want? asked the commandant. And the man who had stepped out said this, I am a Catholic priest. I want to die for this man. I am old. He has a wife and children. I have no one, said Father Maximilian Colby. And to everyone's surprise, the commandant accepted. And then he moved on. That night, nine men and one priest uh, went to the starvation bunker. Normally, they would tear each other apart like cannibals, but not this time. While they had their strength, they lay exhausted on the floor, and the men prayed and sang hymns led by the Catholic priest. After two weeks, three of the men and uh, Father Maximilian were still alive, but the commandant needed the bunker for the next group of ten people. And so at midday, after two weeks in the starvation bunker, and still conscious, the Polish priest was given a lethal injection and died at the age of 47. Fast forward, ten, oh, sorry, fast forward four decades on to October the 10th, uh, 1982, in St. Peter's Square in Rome. Father Maximilian's death was put in its proper perspective. There a crowd of 150,000 had gathered, including Francis Gawieski, his wife, his children, and his grandchildren. For indeed, many had been saved by that one man. The Pope, describing Father Maximilian's death, said, This was victory run over all the systems of contempt and hate in man. A victory like that won by our Lord Jesus Christ. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom of many. You see, like Francis, we are condemned to death in the most horrible way. If we do not have Christ in our life, if we do not look to him as our saviour, then in fact we are no different than Francis Gawiski as he faced the starvation bunker. Because if we die without Christ... The Bible is very clear that we are dying into eternal death, into eternal separation of God, and it is very grim. Do you know if, there, if it wasn't that grim, if there was another way for us to be saved, then Jesus would have never died on the cross. But what lies behind before each one of us without Jesus is so awfully horrible, God sent his son to die for us. You will never understand what Jesus did for us until you understand the depth of our own sin, your own sin, and what awaits for you if you are our Christ. And this is why Jesus steps up to take our place. You see, Maximilian gave his life as a ransom to save one prisoner. But Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of God, gave his life for the ransom of many, including you and I. You know, and Maximilian's death and Jesus' death would have been a tra tragedy. Well, Maximilian's death was a tragedy because what happened was, though someone was set free, Maximilian died and he stayed dead in the grave. And that's tragic. There's a beauty to that tragic. There's something that attracts us to the sacrifice of that story, but it's still tragic because the Polish priest was still in the grave. 
But you see, there's no tragedy with the death of Jesus. He died, and if he'd stayed in the, cro- in the grave and saved us, well, that would have been nice, but it would have been a tragedy. Jesus did not stay in the grave. He rose from the dead. So his ransom did not just save us lives so that we would die in another few decades later like Francis did. Jesus died on the cross and the tomb was empty because he crushed Satan's head. He defeated death. He destroyed sin and was raised from the dead. So not only are we ransomed, we are ransomed into eternal life. We are ransomed into forgiveness in the here and now and in the heavenly places. We are ransomed into being adopted as the beloved daughters and sons of the living God. And that is why Easter is never a tragedy. Oh yes, Good Friday is awfully dark and it moves our spirits and uh, we sense something of the anguish of what Jesus went through. But there is always the good news of Easter Sunday and how Christ rose from the dead. Because of Jesus' ransom for us, we are forgiven and adopted as dearly loved children who will be with our Lord and Saviour when he returns in his glory. And we won't be on his right or his left, (laughs) neither will James or John. That's for him to decide. But when Jesus comes again in glory, because he ransomed his life for us, all those who look to Jesus will be with him and never separated from Christ for time without end. This is the good news of the gospel. This is what we declare this Easter Sunday. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, Mark's made us work today. Fancy cutting the gospel off there with the woman terrified and afraid. But we thank you that we know that they got over that and they went and told the disciples and then you appeared to those two on Emmaus Road and then later on in the upper room. and Oh, the rejoicing of the disciples when they saw you raised from the dead. And that same rejoicing is in our hearts because we know that you are raised from the dead. And so we commit ourselves to you. We continue to pray that we may live lives worthy of what you've called us to, not because in our own strength, but because of the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Help us to declare faithfully that Jesus Christ has risen today, that we may sing his praises, not only in this life, but all eternity. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to celebrate now as the music team come and lead us in our final song.